Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of the Debated Podcast, which is a recording uh, based on the 2021 end of year live episode, live stream. Um, the first 12 minutes or so of the podcast come from the first attempt um, to do the live stream, um, but only feature myself and Conrad, and then the podcast going on from that features all the guests. I hope you enjoy listening to this episode. Apologies is it is slightly cobbled together <laughs> uh, from the recording of the live stream. Uh, thank you for listening and on with the episode. Dude, we are going to energise the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. The independence case is a powerful one. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello, everybody listening. Uh, this is the Debated Podcast live stream, the very first live episode. Um, we should hopefully be getting everyone uh, on very soon. Um, so, you know, it's just going to be a case of uh, waiting. Uh, hopefully there won't be too many technical difficulties. Uh, I hope. Oh, we have uh, Conrad here. Let me just add him. Hello. In. Hello. Can you hear me, Conrad? Yep. I can hear you. you. You're broadcasting live on the live stream now. You've uh, entered the chat. So uh, how are you? I hope everything's going uh, well for you at the moment. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, not bad. How are you? Yes, no, no, I'm doing well. I mean, obviously, we'll be getting into this when the uh, the podcast really gets going. But um, there's obviously been some quite uh, worrying news related to potential new Restrictions being implemented, aren't there? And I think that that's something that is going to be on a lot of people's minds uh, today, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. I think it's all anyone's worried about at the moment, really. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and I think, um, I mean, I don't think it's going to be ho- hopefully affecting your Christmas plans too much, but I imagine it will be affecting the Christmas plans of a lot of people um, that we know. Uh, I, I think that'll probably be the case. Yeah, I mean, personally the impact shouldn't be too bad but mm-hmm. um yeah it's about everyone really and you know it's all the especially all the businesses who have you know got their christmas lunches christmas parties all those yeah. kind of things new year's parties that all booked out in hospitality and restaurants and things um they're going to be you know wondering whether they're going to have any business left in the new year Absolutely, and I think um, that's something that's been a, a you know a real uh, concern for many people, hasn't it? For many businesses, um, that it, it it's just a, a a case of well, what's going to be uh, happening if there aren't any uh, you know support for um, businesses, which obviously we we we've not really seen any sort of like moves towards greater support at the moment, have we? Um, no, I mean, I know if Rishi flew back to um, sort of have some discussions, but there's not been any announcement of any new funds yet. I mean, I think they'll need to. So certainly, if they bring in a, a lockdown, which is the the rumor, yeah. But even even to be honest, with it as it is at the moment, there's you know a lockdown almost by stealth in terms of how it's affecting a lot of businesses because they're telling people not to go out, and if you're going to tell people not to go out then a lot of people won't, and then that's going to still have the impact, but they're not going to have the, all the support that they had in, like, the first lockdown. No, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, if there just isn't uh, that support, that's going to really have a, a major effect, not just on the economy next year, but also on um, potential, you know, um, local elections, elections, because, of course, we're going to be having uh, local and regional elections next year, aren't we? And that might harm the Conservatives uh prospects it could do yeah i mean um i certainly obviously we've seen with the by-election in north shropshire and even before that in cheshire and amersham that sort of there are people disillusioned with the party at the moment who want to sort of protest vote and local elections have traditionally been a outlet for protest votes even though it might not necessarily seem fair obviously it's not got anything to do with the um the local councillors you know they're mm. not the ones setting the restrictions but um you know they they will get sort of the the brunt of the punishment in 2022 i would think 
Yeah, and I think that, as you say, this is something that's going to be really um, going forward and it's going to be a great uh, difficulty um, for, you know, uh, particularly defending councillors because, of course, um, a lot of councils may inadvertently uh, be blamed, mightn't they? I mean, obviously, the, the main association is uh, with the government, but, you know, I, I, th- I think people do have a tendency to um, lash out where they think that, you know, um, is, is, is the most blame uh, for people. And sometimes that might be their local councillor or their, or their local MP, you know, saying if they didn't vote one way or the other, that, oh, well, you know, it's not um, it's not exactly uh, just the government's fault. It's the, the particular local member of parliament's fault as well. Yeah, I mean, I think um, obviously there, was a, um, there, there might be differences in that across the country because obviously there's, there was a lot of MPs about 100 who voted against sort of the vaccine passports. I don't know how many are going to vote against the next lockdown if it, if it happens, but I'm sure there will be ones voting against, and I wonder if they'll sort of see some of their support retained in their areas. Yeah, exactly. And as, as you say, it could be a case that um, particular, uh, you know, voters um, don't... Uh, support um, MPs or councillors who they feel haven't, uh, you know, voted the way uh, that they wanted uh, to. Um, So I'm not quite sure what's happened uh, with our other guests. There are meant to be uh, two other guests uh, on this episode of the podcast. There seems to be some um, slight technical difficulties with them coming into the studio uh, for some reason. So we'll... uh, you know, just uh, have a bit of a chat for a moment, see if we can uh, get them. The um, perils of doing it live, isn't it? Yes, the perils of doing it live, absolutely. Um, <laughs> this is probably the first time that we've ever done an episode live. Um, but, I mean, next year we're going to be seeing some interesting elections as well, aren't we, in um, both the US and uh, France, presidential elections in France and midterm elections in uh, the United States. I mean, how much do you think COVID is going to impact on those elections as well? Well, I think um, obviously it's still going to be, well, COVID's not going to go away, as, um, mm-hmm. as, although some people seem to think that it will if you just lock down hard enough. But, um, you know, it's not, it, it will be here for, you know, for the long term. So you have to learn to live with it. And that's going to have its impacts on all sorts of, you know, different areas of people's lives. And I think there's different ways in which sort of COVID will impact elections that we, you know, obviously the obvious thing is like you know, sports are different policies and dire- directly on public health. But there's also like the secondary policies, like things on like education. We already saw mm. in Virginia, we saw the um, yeah. um, Glenn Youngkin win a, a, a slightly shock result, a, a big victory. And that was, you know, education was his big thing. And, a lot of people were against the schools being shut and, you know, and it's, you know, having that home schooling meant they had more interest in sort of what their kids were actually learning. Mm. And that sort of led to um, a lot of the sort of backlash against what was being taught in schools. So um, I think there, there's sort of all these other areas that are going to come out of COVID that aren't even directly um, linked to it, but, I think they will impact, you know, elections for years to come, maybe even decades to come. Uh, yeah, no, I think you're right that there uh, will certainly be, uh, you know, uh, elections to come that may be going out from COVID and impacting. I mean, certainly, I think, as as you say, um, the Glenn Youngkin victory has certainly had, uh, I think, an impact on um, the way that, you know, democratic uh, politics will function in the US and I think it's also going to have an impact on the way that the Democrats view themselves in particular um, states. I think that you know if, if, we, if we're going to see a shift it's going to be not necessarily as people thought against the sort of like the Trumpian politics uh, of before though of course Youngkin wasn't uh, exactly you know as, as close with Donald Trump uh, in certain instances as perhaps he could have been Um, Do you think then that the relationship between COVID and Trump's defeat may have been a bit 
under uh, played or overplayed do you think that um when it comes to, to 2024 if trump is the republican candidate that his handling of the virus will play much into people's minds well i think um it'll play into some people's minds um i think you know trump probably would have won if it wasn't for for covid mm-hmm. you know because i mean the the economy was his sort of big strong point and he had to or uh, not even just as him but governors because it had to be shut down for for a time which was um yeah didn't do it much favors but um yeah i mean even even with that he did increase his support especially amongst the hispanics um and you saw his vote increasing in sort of rural parts of texas um that are you know border counties that are very hispanic and there's bits of florida as well and that was um that's been attributed i don't see i don't know who it's sort of down to the individual, but uh, that's been attributed partly to being to do with the, you know, they, they preferred Trump's sort of COVID policy mm-hmm. of keeping things open. So um, I guess it works both ways in that some people might have said, oh, he didn't do enough. Some people said, he, you know, he, he did about right. Maybe some people think he did still did too much, you know, because he's, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're very hardcore anti-vax, you know, Trump did promote the vaccine very strongly. Yeah. Um, you know, more, more than... Um, than a lot of um, sort of very anti-vax people might have expected him to. So there's, I guess there's there's all sorts of different elements which which are, which would come into how they view his COVID response. But um, yeah, I think is that still going to be in people's minds next time around? Um, I think Trump will want to sort of focus on what it was like for the years before that and think look at the economy for most of my presidency rather than just looking at the the, the last year when when it was you know all the the covid stuff came in but um i think yeah trump i mean i think he will be running again so mm. i guess it's, it's it will, time will tell whether how much that will actually impact him i mean it seems to me at the moment he'd probably be favorite if it was against joe biden but um obviously there's still you know a few years left so. yeah yeah, Maybe absolutely. Great. A lot of things could change uh, between then. We're also hoping things are going to change in a few minutes. I'm going to just be um, briefly uh, ending the live stream uh, so that we can try and get our other two guests on. Everybody um, is here. So the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is, what do we all think has been the biggest political news story of the year, if we leave COVID aside for one moment, what do we think has been the single biggest sort of political um, news story of the year? Torin, if you would like to kick off and start. In some ways, it's an, and it, I think it's a weird one. It's kind of COVID related, but probably more um, to do with the Conservatives is uh, Dominic Cummings' trip to Barnard Castle to test out his eyesight on a motorway. Um, in part because, you know, obviously it's it's a, a horrendous excuse that you would ever test your eyesight um, with fast-moving vehicles. Um, but I, I think also the fact that it, it kind of was the beginning of what I think now we're just seeing is sort of an endless bout of sleaze coming out of the government. So, uh, and I think it was the biggest, not specifically because of the, the event itself, but just because of what it started, which was just, you know, the Christmas party, um, and uh, you know, more recently, the the, the two by elections that the Lib Dems won. Hmm. It's effectively just been. It, it was that beginning of um, sort of the end for the Conservative government at the moment. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think you're right in in saying that it was. I mean, a, a story that really electrified the political scene at the time that it happened, and has had so many um, consequential. Uh, repercussions. I think what's interesting, as I was um, discussing with um, William Kajani on another recent podcast, is it's interesting how with um, the Cummings affair, that was anger directed at one person for breaking the rules. Whereas as you mentioned the parties thing there, you know, we've got anger directed at the entire government for seeming to um, break the rules and the restrictions that they uh, put in place. So it's, it, it's, it's quite different in terms of, I think, the scope of anger and also the direction of anger. Um, George, if I could turn to you now, I mean, what do you think is the biggest sort of 
political story of the year as, as far as you're concerned um, that isn't sort of, you know, the coronavirus pandemic? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to perhaps go a bit away from Torin and focus on something that doesn't even touch COVID, which was the fall of Afghanistan. I, I mm. think that's really huge. And I think a lot of people talking about politics this year and where it's at. I mean, it, it's been a really weird year because we've had half the year where Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party have looked unassailable. They've had gigantic leads in the polls. They had a really good set of local elections. They won the Hartlepool by-election. Um, and then in the other half, it's gone completely catastrophic. And then they've, <laughs> they've lost North Shropshire and, and all that's been weird. But what's been consistent this year, and I think that's something which is getting lost in all of this, is there's been a consistent disaster of foreign policy. Um, we're perhaps going to see this continue to 2022 with the possible invasion of Ukraine, but the collapse of the Kabul government and the, um, well, the victory of the Taliban is possibly the biggest thing that happened this year because it's changed the geopolitical landscape so massively because the Taliban have now become um, participants, I believe, or at least they're about to become participants in the Chinese Belt and Road program. They're receiving aid from them. And the shifted this and like the president biden's isolation policies which kind of just continue the trump era but in a more um i, I don't want to use a phrase effective but a, a more meaningful way hmm. have led to this so I, I think that's the most um interesting and probably important thing that's happened this year not not to sound too full of my own opinion <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, I think in terms of, um, you know, the international stakes, it certainly has been one of the most uh, I important uh, things that has happened this year. Because, I mean, the US and coalition presence in Afghanistan has been something that has been, you know, consistent for uh, 20 odd years. You know, th th this isn't a sort of an ending to a short conflict. This is a, an ending to a, a conflict that has involved the United States for decades and decades and has in one way or another, affected the presidencies of four US presidents. I mean, that is unprecedented in many ways in the way that it has um, tarnished the reputations of some presidents and the way that it has um, in, in, indeed um, caused perhaps the downfall of certain presidents, for example, uh, George W. Bush. I mean, certainly by the time of uh, the end of uh, his presidency and the just utter disdain that the country had for him, um, the the Iraq uh, intervention was seen very much in a in a negative light, and for many people has been seen as a in a negative light since the um, of a invasions occurred in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it, it's bring it's bringing towards the end of a, a, a period of U.S. politics that has been both fascinating and for many people um, horrifying. Uh, Conrad, if I could turn to you, I mean, what do you think of as the sort of the the big story? Uh, of this year in terms of uh, politics that isn't related to COVID or isn't COVID? Uh, I think the, the big ones have been taken. Um, are, we, <laughs> are we talking UK or just broader? Well, UK, US, w whatever you think is this on like the big... Because I, I was going to say um, the German election and mm -hmm. um, the fact that Angela Merkel, for the first time in you know, since 2005, isn't Chancellor of Germany. I think that's going to be you know, a big shift because she's been such a presence, you know, like on whether you agree with her or not, you know, I don't agree with her on a lot, but there's, um, there's still, you know, having a different person in there, having a different government and the CDU not in power in mm -hmm. Germany is going to sort of shape the direction of the EU, certainly in the next, um, next few years. And, you know, I guess it's still, we won't yet see, I guess, how, what direction it will go in, whether it will be, um, you know, more to the left because it's the you know, socialists in there and you've got the, the Greens as well. So will that cause any kind of um, shift towards more green policies? What does it mean for energy in terms of, you know, Merkel had quite a reliance on, on, on Russia um, to, to, for the, in terms of getting energy. Um, will, it change, will it change that, having Greens in there mm. um, in terms of Russian gas and things like that? Um, and yeah, in terms of the sort of foreign policy, or the, the fact that it has a foreign policy, I'm, <laughs> cause I'm not very happy about, but <laughs> that it doesn't nonetheless. And um, the yeah, how will it be affected by German election? I guess it's still the jury's still out um, exactly how it will change, but I think that is 
that is going to be a major sort of thing we'll look back at and think well that that election was quite important for sort of the future of the west i guess yeah absolutely and i think it's interesting as well I mean, you mentioned there the, the length of time that Angela Merkel has been Chancellor. Again, he's, he's, he's almost of a, a similar length to um, the United States and the coalition, um, you know, in, invasion and intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we're seeing really the end of uh, very much a sort of um, political uh, age that was, you know, involving, as, as Conrad mentioned, um, you know, great European foreign policy, foreign policy efforts, uh, which were sometimes, you know, at a, a, a disadvantage to um, the foreign policy efforts of the United States, was ending in seeing an end of perhaps great interventionism. We're not, we perhaps won't see as much interventionism. I mean, what is that going to sort of like say for, uh, you know, the rest of the world in terms of how much certain countries uh, rely on protection either from the United States or from other nations against nations that threaten them. I'm thinking of um, Taiwan, for example. You know, I mean, what is it going to signify? We, we, we do really seem to be at a, a turning point when we have a, a, a US commander in chief who is more of a, uh, an, an isolationist than perhaps previous presidents following on um, from Trump's sort of appeal to uh, isolationism on the world stage in, in terms of intervention. So I'd like to now um, open the floor in terms of that as a, as, as a question. Um, looking at international politics in the last year, I mean, do we sort of consider it perhaps to be a turning point? Do you think things are really going to dramatically change going into 2022 in terms of international politics? Or is it just, you know, Merkel going, um, Afghanistan ending, they're just sort of like blips, but the general trend of international politics isn't going to change too much i mean anyone can jump in with what they with what they think i guess i think the the french election is going to be a big thing in this in which way that goes um obviously if macron's re-elected then nothing much will change but obviously there's you know progress there's the there's um, Le Pen, there's the Moore, you know, and each one of those would have a, a very different sort of foreign policy to what Macron has. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, you know, along with Germany, France is the other big country in the EU that had sort of shifts and sort of has shifted the direction of how that how that EU is on the world stage. And um, yeah, M Macron and Merkel were quite close together and quite similar in terms of their policies. Um, on the international stage, at least, but um, mm. and well, quite a lot of the on the domestic stage as well, to be honest. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's very, very different <laughs> kinds of politicians who could win the French presidency that would, mm. would shift it, you know, very much so. And I think if if any if you know if Zemmour won or if Le Pen won, that would be, you know. A gargantuan shift in, in international politics, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Torin, what are, what are your thoughts in, in terms of that, in terms of the shifts of international politics that we've seen uh, of late? I mean, I think the, the, the big one, and it kind of picks up on, on what George said about um, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I was sad enough to pick it as my dissertation subject, uh, which was a very, very fun few weeks. But I honestly think that's one of the things that's been shifting behind the scenes and yet hasn't really been picked up on. Um, in part, because obviously if you go to you know, the general person and say, do you know what the Belt and Road Initiative is? The answer is probably not, because it's, it's this enormous project. It covers you know, a huge number of countries and yet it, it barely gets any coverage. And I think that, especially with the situation with sort of debt trap diplomacy that um, China has been using effectively, putting countries that are already struggling, giving them massive infrastructure projects, um, like in areas like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, um, Djibouti, all of those kind of areas, they, they get into these, these massive debt traps and they can't do anything about it. Um, and some of these are in very strategic locations. I mean, Djibouti is literally next to a choke point. Um, and so you kind of have these, I, I think those, those things, you know, is it certain that anything will happen um, in the next year with the Belt and Road Initiative? It isn't. But at the same time, 
the potential for stuff to happen there or stuff to go wrong even is is quite large as that project expands further and it, as i said it already has an enormous number of countries involved with it so you know i think that would be something in my eyes to sort of keep an eye on in the next year is what happens with that because as i said it could either be all silence or there could be quite a lot of action on on china's end of things hmm. absolutely I, I i think you're right in terms of that um I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative is perhaps one of the biggest things that's going on in international politics that so few people um, know about and so few people are engaged with. So, I, I mean, I think you're, you're totally right to, to pick up on that. Um, George, I mean, what are your thoughts in, in terms of, you know, the changes in international politics? Do you think that with Merkel going and Afghanistan that this is just a blip or we're going to be seeing a, a bigger sort of seismic change in international politics? I think it's not going to be so much as a massive seismal change, but I think it's going to be the consolidation of a bit of an international decline of the West, which has been going on for a little while now. Not to sound like too much of a pessimist here. Um, <laughs> so, um, basically, what, what, what I think of is, um, and I might be biased because I'm currently uh, reading through Reaganland, which um, we'll have the pleasure of interviewing the author about, but I, I currently look at the world stage now that Merkel's gone. And I, I look at, you know, the political players who are there and there's not particularly menacing or important in the West side. Like President Joe Biden is very, as I said, isolationist. And I think it's going to get worse as it, his presidency goes on because by November time, we're going to have the midterm elections and mm. it's not going to go well for him. Mm. I, I don't think he's going to put back. I think he's going to lose control of the House, possibly the Senate. And history tells us that when a president doesn't have control of, of either house, it doesn't go well for them with foreign policy. They don't get what to do what they want to do. Um, Obama was hamstrung in his attempts to go into Syria. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was forced to like abandon the League of Nations, which he set up. Um, it just never goes well for them. Mm. I, I think 2022, um, I can't even say the year I'm that frightened of it. <laughs> is going to be a year, essentially mad things occur on the geopolitical stage and there was general responses eh, what can we do about it and i think that's probably what's going to happen with ukraine I, I reckon it's going to be invaded and we'll send sanctions to russia's doorstep we'll provide you know aid and money to the ukrainians but i, I think it'll be a lot more muted rather like the soviet invasion of afghanistan except mm. it's probably less profitable for how it comes out for us being the complete destruction of the um, <laughs> military and political will to carry on the war I, I but that's speaking in quite certain terms about something which changes every day mm. yeah, yeah absolutely got, i've got a very gloomy and kind of late 70s-esque view of international politics at the moment <laughs> hopefully that isn't um, influenced too much by reading um rick perlstein's excellent book reaganland hopefully that <laughs> um it really is um because I'm also um, going to be in January rereading When the Lights Went Out, uh, which is a fantastic social history on Britain in the 70s, which also gets to grip with the whole uh, real doom and gloom of that decade, because I, I get the feeling I'm going to need to um, understand it a bit more, given... <laughs> Yeah, no, I think we're all probably going to have to understand it a bit more. But, I mean, turning away from international politics for a moment and looking back at the UK... Obviously, we have um, briefly touched upon, you know, things that have happened with Boris Johnson and the Conservative government, with Dominic Cummings and the various parties, etc. Um, but what is going to ultimately come of this? Do we think that it's going to be, you know, the downfall of him uh, as, as, as leader of the party? Obviously, un unless something incredibly radically um, different changes we're still going to have a Conservative government for the next few years, no matter who the Prime Minister is. But are we going to be seeing the, the end of Boris Johnson in 2022? And who will we potentially be seeing in the running to replace him? Again, opening the floor, whoever wants to, to come in to respond to that first. I honestly think that my guess is... I mean, firstly, I don't. I, I never like being handed crystal balls um, <laughs> because you never know what's going to happen in terms of. <laughs> it's okay. It's, you never know what's going to happen in terms of predictions. So it's, it is a really difficult one because, 
at, at the one hand, I go, oh, well, you know, obviously any politician at this point has got to be finished, but also than I remember it is Boris. Mm. And and that that's a difficult one, which is, you know, we've not really seen an, an enormous test of him yet. So, you know, we've we've had the two by-elections, as I said earlier, that the Lib Dems have won. But the issue with by-elections, of course, is you're not actually going to change the, the seat makeup of the country. Mm. You are going to change it by one seat. You know that Boris will still have a majority at the end of the day. It gives you an opportunity to say, I'm not happy with the situation at the moment. Mm. Um, and, you know, when I saw the whole Barnard Castle palaver, I thought, well, you know, that's, that's going to be it. And it, it wasn't. Boris was still there. And, and it sort of, he certainly didn't ride over it easily, but then it sort of just got lost. And, and that's my worry now, which is that, you know, yeah, he, he may be able to stick around. Um, I think his time is probably limited. I think someone like Rishi Sunak is, is in the background waiting um, and will probably uh, jump at some point towards leadership. So I think Boris's issue right now is, is very much internally Mm -hmm. um, that there will be conservative MPs. So I think it's it, the, the best way I could describe it is probably the beginning of the end. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's certainly a sentiment that a lot of people uh, have. Uh, I mean, Conrad, as someone who is in fact a conservative member who supported um, Boris, I mean, w what do you see as his potential future? Do you think that his time is limited? Do you think that he'll be able to get around this? I mean, what do you think? Well, I mean... I don't think there's going to be any immediate thing you move to sort of shift him unless something like really bad comes out, you know, of like some picture of him, you know, in a legal rave or something like that. <laughs> then maybe, you know, he'd have to go immediately. But I think, you know, notwithstanding that, I think he's safe at least for the next few months. But I guess it's... Um, you know, this has he has been damaged certainly over the last few few sort of weeks and months. Um, you know, and especially with the um, sort of all these Christmas party stuff. I know, you know, you might seem it silly, but it does seem to have cut through to a lot of people, mm. and um, you know, it's made them see the government a lot more negatively than they did before. Mm. You know, where I think a lot of people, you know, they're not exactly excited to vote Keir Starmer, but they're not saying they don't want to particularly want to vote conservative at the moment or they're you know not too enthusiastic about it i think obviously you know there are other candidates you mentioned rishi sunak and there's also people like liz truss there's also backbenchers like you know mark harper or graham brady who are sort of waiting around and i'm sure would you know want another punt at it mm. so that you know there's certainly not a lack of ambition from the other members but yeah, I think, I think it's certainly if he brings another lockdown, I think that will lose him a lot of support amongst Conservative members um, from the people, you know, who've you know, supported him for his Brexit views, thought he was the man to get Brexit done, and he was. But has he done anything else that's, you know, particularly Conservative since then? Probably not. So... Mm. Um, yeah, I think there's all because it's because I mean it's not just the, the COVID response, but there's things like the um, all the the migration crisis in the Channel that is you know a lot of conservatives are very concerned about that and conservative leaning voters as well. So you know there's lots of areas where I think you just need to get a grip essentially and start you know governing like he promised. Mm -hmm. I mean, George, what are your thoughts relating to this? Do you think that next year we are going to see um, the end of Boris Johnson, you know, other people going into the role as Prime Minister, Rishi, Rishi Sunak, uh, Liz Truss, whoever, or do you think he's going to be able to, to cling on? Um, will he be able to cling on? That's a pretty loaded question. Um, <laughs> I just want to say thank you to Conrad for reminding me of Graham Brady's leadership attempt because I forgot about it and it brings me joy whenever I think about it because he just didn't, because he resigned from the 1922 committee to run, didn't run, and then just became chair of it again like nothing happened and I love it. So to answer your question, 
I think what's going to happen is Boris is going to cling on. I think that the Conservative Party in its infighting, much like my party is infighting, will do what it does, does best and kind of just start um, tearing chunks out of each other. And privately, occasionally it's spilling over into public. We've already seen this with the fact that Steve Baker has kicked Nadine Doris out of the um, WhatsApp group, group chat. And it started actually undermining and um, putting sarky comments on BBC Breakfast whenever Dominic Raab's on it, like he did today, for instance. I don't think it's going to get into a lot of briefing because most people are starting to think in terms of post-Boris and when you're a prime minister like that, you're stuffed. Um, I think what will most likely happen is he's going to limp on until about May when the local elections happen. And I honestly say I reckon he's in for a thumping. And I reckon given the fact that there's by-elections being speculated right now for Dillon and for Wakefield, those two are probably going to go back our way. Mm. And it's going to create a situation where his position becomes untenable with the Conservative Party, at least with its MPs, since they tend to back winners. Um, and when they aren't winners, they're gone. Um, the only exception to that being William Hague. <laughs> I don't know, honestly. Um, that's up to people like Conrad. And I can't say I, I would know who I would pick in that situation. I, but I think no matter who wins... I think all of them are facing the same thing, which is why I've been reading Reagan and why I'm rereading When the Lights Went Out, because I think that this decade is going to be defined by kind of like a, a poisoned chalice of government, which is, I mean, Cameron kind of hinted at it, which is the uh, migrant crisis being one aspect of it. But no matter which Tories in government, all of them have got to face the issues of the fact that the National Health Service is currently overstretched and in dire need of some level of reform, which is a massive political effort. The immigration system needs massive reform, which is a humongous political effort. The climate crisis is getting worse, and it wasn't fixed at COP26. It didn't come close to being fixed at COP26, and that's going to require a lot of political effort and a lot of funding. Leveling up requires a lot of political effort. And, of course, the cost of living crisis that's occurring right now since inflation is returning and fuel prices are going up. All, all of these things on, by themselves are humongous political issues. Having them happen all roughly around about the same time and kind of overlapping each other is catastrophic. Mm. And I, I, don't, I don't say that, you know, with any kind of political antenna. It's just a general fact. It's not a good situation for any government to be in. And, you know, I'm obviously biased. I, I look at the current prime minister and his would-be successors, and I don't think any of them are up to the task of mm. dealing with one of them properly, let alone all of them. But I, I worry about that, and I really do. So I, I think whoever takes over Boris Johnson, I don't think it's going to be Sunak person. I'm leaning towards either Liz Truss or someone a bit more obscure. He's going to have to deal with that. My only hope is that uh, the rumours are true, and Matt Hancock does a run for it because God, I would love to see that. <laughs> I think that that would certainly uh, be uh, an, an an interesting uh, run for the. Uh, for the leadership of Matt Hancock, given uh, everything that happened uh, with him was to attempt to run for the leadership of the Conservative Party. It, 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 would, certainly, it would certainly be a run that people would uh, remember and, you know, would be of uh, interest to a lot of different people. So we're going to turn uh, to the final question uh, now for you as, as we come towards the end of this look back, this live look back on 2021. And the final question... Uh, for you three is this 2022 is going to be a new year it's going to be a, a new dawn we'll see uh what will come in that year but if you were to see one massive change in 2022 what would be that one massive change it doesn't necessarily have to be to do with politics it can be due with something uh in culture or television but one big change in 2022. Uh, whoever wants to start, whoever's got an idea, can pitch in first. Can I just say COVID disappearing? Yes, that's I it. Kind of, no, it's probably what we're all thinking, but yeah. um, like that's honestly, that's the, um, the only one that I could, it was just at the front of my mind and I was thinking, uh, you know, because I'm in Wales at the moment, we're probably, probably heading into a, another lockdown here, if not in England as well. And um, yeah, I, I would have to say that given it's it's on the news every day and it's kind of the thing at the front of everyone's minds, um, that would that would have to be.
Yeah. I mean, I think that that's certainly, like you say, Torin, one of the, the big ones that I think is at the front of uh, everybody's minds. Conrad, I mean, what do you think is the sort of like the one big change that you would really like to see next year? Well, I mean, yeah, aside from COVID disappearing, which is, yeah, I think everyone would like that, or or even if it didn't disappear, you know, living as if it if it wasn't there, <laughs> at least. But um, yeah, aside from those, um, I think... I think the the big change needs to be something to do with um, taxes. I think we need, you know, I've, the national insurance increase coming up should be scrapped, and we need to actually start, you know, with the cost of living going up so much. I think we need to let people keep a bit more of their own money that they're earning. George, what would be the uh, big change that you would like to see in twenty twenty two? Well, um, since Torrin's taken the big one um, away, <laughs> I'm going to go with my um, usual wish that I wish would happen every year, which is that miraculously Parliament would just decide, yeah, we're going to reverse the beaching cuts and all the local train lines come back uh, because infrastructure is on the floor, it all needs reform. Um, I say this as somebody who's suffered with train lines for years hmm. and what I would really like in 2022 is if just suddenly loads of little local lines came back all of a sudden, there were more options for commuters, it worked properly, I wasn't reliant on just one big line going from Wakefield to Leeds or to York or whatever. So that would be my big wish, um, but in case that's not deliverable, I'd just settle for Femi releasing a um, plug-in keyboard album. <laughs> I think I think that that would be a uh, certainly um, something we could all enjoy. I'm, I'm not sure how much he would um, in, in, enjoy the reception to that, but um, it's actually, as well, if I might just hijack this podcast for a mm-hmm. second, I, I did prepare something, and I, I want to spring this on all of you um, since this is a live thing. And I was digging around the archives of my podcast, and um, I realised that most of this year kind of just gets forgotten about whenever people talk about politics in retrospective, and I've got a quiz um, from what I call the guff part of this year, which was like from about May to September time. And I was wondering if I could test your political memories, if that's okay with Will. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, give it a go. I mean, we'll probably all fail because, uh, (laughs) as you say, it's it's from a part of the year that everybody's uh, forgotten about. But if you you want to give that a go, George, then I'm more than happy to go along with that. Excellent. Uh, Comrade Torin, are you up for this? Sure. (laughs) <laughs> as up for it as I can be when part of the year that I didn't pay attention to and so I noted the absolute fear from both of you in that um, so this should be <laughs> okay um, well let, we'll try and go through this I'm going to give the answers to each question as we go along because I don't think anyone's got pen and paper handy so let's just go um, the first question is, can you name me the three cabinet members of the government who were sent to the backbenches in the reshuffle? And for an extra bonus point, uh, can you tell me what position they held before they were reshuffled? They've got about um, just 10 seconds there. Which, um, <laughs> um, I'm just going to write down your names here just so I can keep track of the score. I feel like um, I'm back at school again. <laughs> Oh, you Mine's racing, trying to remember. Oh, good lord. Um, well, since he's been silent the whole time, let's start with Will. Will, have you got the answers uh, you'd like uh, to give? Oh, oh, God. Um, you see, I feel like this is almost revenge um, from all the times that I have uh, come up with questions to, uh, <laughs> to surprise people and to keep people um, on their toes. I feel that this is, in fact, probably the perfect revenge. This is George's catharsis. Um, (laughs) No, I've no idea. Off the top of my head. Conrad, do you have any idea of an answer? Um, uh, No. (laughs) You've got got nothing here. This all lies on Torrin, then. Torrin, have you got anything? I didn't even remember that the reshuffle had happened. (laughs) I was like, oh wait, yeah, there was a there was a reshuffle at that point. I went, I can't remember who they were though. Okay, I'm gonna give you the answer. I guess that um that shows a successful reshuffle for Boris. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nobody <laughs> noticed. So the, the the nobodies who we all failed to remember is Gavin Williamson, the education secretary. Um 
Robert Jenrick, the Housing, Go Communities and Local Government Secretary, last of his kind since Michael Gove absorbed that to become Minister of Leveling Up, and Robert Buckland, who was Justice Minister. Do you remember these people? Yes, we do remember them. I just don't think we remember them being reshuffled. Gavin Williamson, yeah. because of the whole... Like a different era, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this was all back in, uh, what, July as well, so this is... This just shows how this year has stretched out so long politically. Um, okay, question two. Um, Matt Hancock was forced to resign after his affair was outed to the press. But can, for two points, can you tell me which outlet broke the story and at what time of day the story broke? So again, you've got 10 seconds there just to kind of wow. brief. Uh, See the old say, man. I want to say the sun, but I don't know yeah. if that's right. I don't okay, know so the time of day. I think it Tom was the time. Time. Was it was it was it was it about eleven o'clock at night? I remember it being quite late. So, are you saying about eleven o'clock at night and the sun? Well, yes. Uh, Torin, what are you, are you saying? The sun as well. I would guess the sun. Absolutely no idea when it broke. I'd say it, it will have to be somewhere like you know twelve o'clock at night. Oh, okay. So I'm just going to go a random time and see if it works. <laughs> I'm, on the basis of the fact that it's a very niche thing to remember, I'm going to give Will and uh, Torin two points and Comrade one because you're all right. It was the son who broke the story. Um, it was, however, at 1 a.m., which oh, is quite true to the story because he fled in the night to avoid questions from the press, which resulted in him waking up his kid to tell him, I'm going now, as his wife revealed to the tabloids weeks later. Wow. I know. Let's see. If, let's see, uh, the Matt Hancock resignation... This year, I, I keep forgetting it happened. Um, this should be a nice, easy one. Question three. Um, Keir Starmer released a Fabian Society essay, which claimed to be how many words long? Was it 12,000? Will's going for 12,000. Uh, Conrad? Yeah, no, it was far too long. <laughs> um, <laughs> is it, I feel like it's even maybe even longer, like 13,000. Sorry? I feel like, yeah, maybe 13,000, maybe even longer than, the, than what Will said. Okay, Torin? I'm going to up that bet and go 15,000. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. I like this game of poker. <laughs> None of you got it right, and both Torin and Conrad were exactly a thousand out because it was 14,000 words. <laughs> But of course, it claimed to be that long, but actually it was 12,600 words long. He um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was the closest then if you go on the actual word count I, I, well, yes but we're not going to because no, uh, that... no. <laughs> because we're going how long it was claimed to be um, this one so I've, I've done a bit of Tory bashing a bit of Labour bashing time for a bit of Lib Dem bashing uh, can anyone name the Lib Dem spokesperson on education is it Layla Moran you going Layla Moran Will um, I'm going to go Alistair Carmichael simply because he was the first guest on the podcast. Um, sorry? Daisy Cooper? <laughs> well done, I Conrad. What point? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, um, Conrad got that one right. Uh, it is Layla Moran. When I asked this question you on my guess. own, <laughs> nobody got it. <laughs> Which is fantastic. Um, so let me just update your scores here. It's actually currently a dead heat as well, so there's all to play for. And there we go. Right. Um, the Rise for Politics for All, that Twitter account we all love, um, has been shrouded in a series of beefs online. Can you tell me two big political players that the Twitter page has beefed with this year? Ooh. Simone Hannah. <laughs> <Is that him? laughs> uh... Um... Was was one of them Britain elect? Okay, I'm. I don't know if I can accept that because that's not what I've got written down on my sheet. But I wrote this down <laughs> in um, September, so <clears throat> I I could be open to accepting that. But does anyone have any other answers? I feel like I don't know. I feel like someone like Nadine Dorries would sort have. Of had a row with them, but I don't know. Probably. I'm trying to remember. Okay, so since we're a bit stumped by that one, I'll give you the answer. Uh, the answers are Nicki Minaj um, and Keir Starmer. Really? Now, that's, that's... 
<laughs> There's the answers, yes. Uh, Nicki Minaj, you might remember, tweeted about her cousin having a vaccine in Trinidad and how that caused his testicles to swell. Um, well, Politics for All got in on that, started tweeting about it, and his page was attacked by Nicki Minaj stands, and he did that thing he does where he decides to go personal with it and started an actual beef with the account, um, with Nicki Minaj's account, tagging her in it and stuff, and her fan accounts, which was amazing. Um, the other one was Keir Starmer, because Politics for All leaked the Fabian Society essay that we were talking about before, and his team sent him defamation threats. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I will accept Britain elects because Britain elects has also gone for him, thank God. Yeah. And I'm happy with that. So, we then... <laughs> The final question, which is actually the trademark of my podcast, Red Rose Reporting, go listen, it's great, um, which is politics or partridge. Um, it's quite simple, really. I'm going to give you two statements. One's from a politician, one from a partridge. Um, the victim this time is Matt Hancock, and this relates to the fact that he tried to re-enter public life with a bit of a relaunch campaign. Now, I need you to tell me whether this is a excerpt from Alan Partridge's Mid-Morning Matters, or if this is a narration I've carefully worded from the walk and talk video Matt made with his constituents. Statement one. There we go. Fist bump, I say as I greet a worker in a fish and chip shop before adding, how are you doing? How's business? Statement two. Oh, you combine the card with a handshake. I used to do that, but kept getting it wrong. Gave a paper cut to a man from Nestle. The uh, first one is Matt Hancock, and the second one is Alan Partridge. Okay. Um, are you agreeing with that, comment or dissenting? Yeah, I agree, yeah. And I Torrance? This video. <laughs> I, think, I think that sounds roughly right, to be honest. Well done. You're all bang right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that video so much. He just looks so sad wandering on his Tad Santa in disbelief that someone said something nice to him. Um, but that, that was the quiz I brought along from the guff part of the year that we all forgot about. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I could use this for another life. And yes, thank you for letting me hijack the uh, podcast well. No, it's not a problem at all. I think that that was probably one of the best organised parts of the podcast. <laughs> so I, I thank you for bringing that organisational skill to, uh, to the podcast, George. It's okay. It's, I, I always end my podcasts with a gimmick um, because, as you can tell, I, I like to um, have a laugh of it. And I'm, I'm also pleased to say all three of you are tied in first place. So uh, well done there, guys. Excellent. Well, um, on that note, I think we will uh, end this uh, live episode of the podcast. Apologies that it hasn't gone exactly um, according to plan, plan for people uh, listening. I hope those who have listened have enjoyed it, whether you're listening live or whether you're listening to the edited version, which will be released not long after the uh, live stream has uh, gone out, probably within a, a day or two. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, for my guests... If people want to follow you, if people want to find out more about you, uh, where should they go to follow you and to find out more about you? George, where should people go to find out more about you? Well, if they're mad enough to want to do that, they should probably head to Twitter because that's where I live. Um, I'm at Fabian Fairhurst, spelt like the society. And if you want to follow my podcast, Red Rose Reporting, which I eventually plan on having a consistent uploading schedule for, you can follow us at Red Reporting on Twitter at Red Rose Reporting on Facebook and at Red Reporting on Instagram of all places. So check us out there. Conrad, if people want to follow you or find out more about you, where should they go? Um, I guess I'm not that very, I'm not that interesting, but um, yeah, my Twitter is Conrad underscore Lou, L E W. Excellent. And Torrid, finally, last but not least, where should people go if they want to find out more about you? It's a very simple one because of my name being so complicated uh, <laughs> on Facebook and on Twitter uh, at Torrin Wilkins. And if you want to follow Centre, uh, again, it is at Centre Think Tank on both of them. Well, thank you once again for everyone who has listened to this episode of the podcast and everyone who has joined in the podcast. I'm going to end with saying I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas, a Merry <coughs> Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com.
www.thegreatdetective.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one. Dude, we are going to energise the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. The independence case is a powerful one. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order!